Hi, thank you all for coming on this suddenly rainy and blustery evening. That was unexpected. We're here to talk about sunny and rainy and blustery Rhode Island politics because it's always all of those things all at the same time, right? So I'm, I'm Hillary Levy Freeman. I'm a professor in the education department here and I'm a fellow at the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. And I also happen to be the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the National Organization for Women. So lots of parts of my life coming together this evening. So I want to start by introducing our esteemed panelists and then I'll kick it off with some questions and then we'll open it up to all of you because I'm sure you have lots of questions and perhaps thoughts as well. So um, I'm going to begin with, I'm going to go alphabetically. So I think we're, we're going to mix up the order a little bit, but I'm going to start with Professor Bob Hackey, who some of you may know because in your, you're in his class here. You're incentivized to be here. It's okay, you can wave. <laughs> um, I, 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 truth in advertising, I did not offer extra credit. I just oh, made an announcement. So that was I, very I, I, smart. I, you know, I'm just saying. None of my students are here, so you're winning. <laughs> so he's a professor. Some Hackey. things are inferred, aren't they? <laughs> right? Extra credit, right? Professor Hackey is a professor of health policy and management at Providence College, and he also teaches here at Brown University. He's the author of Cries of Crisis Rethinking the Healthcare Debate and the New Politics of State Health Policy. His current research focuses on state level implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So thank you so much for being Pleasure here tonight. Be here. Obviously very topical. We also have Dr. Domingo Morell. He's a 2018-2019 visiting scholar at the Annenberg Institute for School Reform here at Brown. And he is also an affiliate with the Taubman Center for American and Politics, American Politics and Policy. His research explores the ways state policies help expand or diminish political inequality among historically marginalized populations. He's a native son of Rhode Island. He's also the author of Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy. Um, additionally, of interest to many of you may be that he's the co-founder and co-chair of the Latino Policy Institute at Roger Williams University here in Rhode Island. So we have the two brown political scientists with their PhDs from here. So Dan York and I even things out. Um, he's not a professor, but he is a very well-recognized media personality here in Rhode Island. Um, you can catch him every day of the week, either on the radio during drive time, 3 to 6 p.m., correct? Mm -hmm. WPRO. Um, and then also his TV program, which is on every week, uh, t aired every day of the week, night, twice yeah. on Fox mm -hmm. and... Correct. Okay. 7.30 on Myri TV and Fox Myri, Broadway, that's Indiana. it. Right. So uh, we're very pleased to have him here today. Some people may say that he's a conservative voice, but I say he's Dan's voice. Do you like that? Yeah, yeah I may have been reputed as conservative a year and a half ago, then Trump <laughs> got elected. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can tell you I have to wear my football helmet just about every day. So. So, so, and I was lucky actually to meet Dan in this room two years ago yeah. at the same time because he did his show live from here, his radio show. So um, this is a great connection and we're glad that he is committed to being here and connecting with Watson and Brown students. So let me start with a question um, that's a little different than what we talked about before, but I would like each of you to name, and you can start Dan, um, what you think the most interesting Rhode Island race is this year and then what you think the most important one is. And those are not necessarily the same. Uh, interesting to me. That's why you're here. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously we've got we've got two we've got two major races. Uh, and that's the governor's race and the senate race. The governor's race is uh, kind of clogged up right now with a battle between the second and third place candidates. And it's, I think, become interesting for its tabloid dynamic. So the importance of the race, I think, has been diminished by the fight that's going on. So that's one way to answer that question. Could you I, specify for some people who might not be aware? Well, it's kind of a lengthy story. Uh, the, the battle between, so let me, just, let me say that, and then I'll, I'll respond in terms of most important race. I mean, the U.S. Senate race, I think, is always, is always vital. Um, but that, that race, while vital and important, is, is, I think, probably predictably 
set in stone with the incumbent Democrat, Sheldon Whitehouse, most likely to win over Bob Flanders. And I, and I find it disappointing in a sense because I said that Bob Flanders is a blue chip candidate running a, a campaign which is, you know, a, I don't want to be disrespectful, but it's, 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 it's just a notch above the junior varsity. And you have to be able to bring it in a whole, in a whole spectacular way in order to unseat a, a, a pretty popular significantly popular, not as popular as the senior senator Jack Reed, but nonetheless a popular incumbent Democrat in a blue state. So um, you can judge as to whether, the, the, you know, what's more important and what's more interesting. So those are the two races. The most impactful race, however, is one that's getting very little attention, and that is the Speaker of the House and his race with a guy by the name of Steve Frias, who is a, a Republican who came 87 votes short last time, two years ago, and mail ballot. In, 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 in won and lost on, on the mail ballots, mm -hmm. um, that race is impollable. So I don't know where it is, but my guess is that it's another down-to-the-wire mm -hmm. exercise for the Speaker of the House, who's got uh, his own challenges and holding on to uh, what he would consider and what most would consider to be the more conservative flavor of the Democratic Party up against the progressive left, which has made a real charge in the General Assembly. And so, uh, and I've had, you know, I get along, you know, professionally very well with the Speaker of the House, but I've had a very hard time with him with his lack of leadership, in my judgment, on some principal issues, including the Pawsock Stadium refinance issue and a whole bunch of other things. So the Speaker of the House is, is mostly known by position as the most powerful position in the state of Rhode Island. I think sometimes it's a little overblown, although he is the uh, he is the vessel and the determiner as to who gets what legislation when, uh, and really kind of holds most most of the the reins on the purse strings there. While the governor, every four years, the governor's office every four years gets a lot of the attention because you know by chart everybody kind of looks at the CEO of the state as is the most important race. So that's a long discussion. I can get, I don't want to dominate here, but I can I can tell you about the dynamics of the governor's race, you know, when and if you, you want me to do that. So Yeah, I, I, great minds think alike here, I guess, because uh, I would second what Dan said in terms of the, for me, the most, import, the most important race is actually the, uh, the, the, the speaker's race in Cranston. Uh, I think that has the most significance for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, there's a lot of um, positioning right now in the state house with folks uh, talking about perhaps a change of leadership. Uh, and obviously, if, if uh, the speaker is not reelected, uh, that opens the gates for that. Um, the other, the other thing for me, the most interesting race is the governor's race. We've got a three-way race once again. Uh, Governor Raimondo won in a three-way race in 2014. Uh, we've got another rerun here. I think that serves her well. Uh, I, I think the um, if if Joe Trillo, who is the um, is running third in the race. We're not involved at this point. Uh, I think that we'd have a much closer uh, contest between Alan Fung and Gina Raimondo. Uh, with Trillo in the race, I think he's siphoning off a lot of her potential support. Uh, here, his potential support. My, I'm sorry. Um, and I think you know one of the one of the interesting things here um, to echo what Dan said. I, I think the speaker's position is extraordinarily significant. Um, and this this the state has a very weak governorship. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, you can override a veto here in this state with three fifths majority as opposed to two thirds. Um, and the governor's role, I think, in many cases, is to set the agenda. But the the, the speaker really does control the purse strings, and the speaker really dictates what happens to the governor's agenda. Uh, so. If that if that's shaken up uh, in November, um, and I think um, I have no sense of how where that race is either. Um, I think you know, this is this is potentially uh, going to be a really interesting January. Yeah. I don't have much to add be, uh, to, to the conversation <laughs> so far because I I agree with this. I mean, if we are to believe what the polls say, which 2016 showed us that we need to be somewhat skeptical mm -hmm. of the polls, but it does look across the board that um, the governor's race and and the Senate race. Uh, pretty safe right now, it looks like, for uh, the Democrats. I do think that starting off, um, the Senate race was the mo most important race because Flanders had, I think, an opportunity to be a much stronger candidate. And for the Democrats, not just in Rhode Island, but nationally, to do what they want to do, which is obviously try to gain a ma majorities in the House and the Senate, 
that would have been critically uh, uh, important for them to keep this seat. But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case anymore. And so in terms of, you know, most interesting and, I'm sorry, most, uh, yeah, most interesting and most important races, I do think that the, the most interesting race is the Speaker of the House race, and, but the most important race starting off, I would have said it was the Senate race. But doesn't look like it's that interesting. Anymore. So now you get the first question sure. because yeah. you had to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how is this year different, do you think, in Rhode Island, if it is? this election cycle? I, I, I don't think it's, you know, that much more different than anything else we've seen over the last four, eight, 12 years. Uh, I, I think, you know, we're starting, we're seeing a lot of interesting hap things happening across the country, but I think that the energy here is not the same that we've seen in other places simply because it looks like, um, you know, you have incumbent, incumbent governor that's well on her way to win, Senate race, the mayor's race, you know, it's also looks pretty safe right now for, for the incumbent. And so I, I don't think um, this year is any more interesting uh, or anything, uh, we're seeing anything more uh, uh, different this year than in other years. I'm curious to hear what others think about that. <clears throat> I agree. This sounds like we all agree with one another. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think uh, you're spot on. I think we're, there's more consistency than change here. Uh, the thing for me, looking at this, Rhode Island is, is, is quite different from other states like Massachusetts, for example, where we saw Ayanna Presley upset a 10-term mm -hmm. incumbent. Exactly. Um, you know, we're, they're both blue states, um, but we, we have not seen that kind of a progressive push here in the state. We did, and to some extent, in 2016. Uh, we saw folks like Maura Walsh get elected to the General Assembly, Marsha Raglan Vag. Uh, uh, Reglan uh, Vassal, I'm sorry, uh, got elected. Uh, both of them survived primary challenges this year. Uh, so I, I think we, we see more consistency there. Um, I think the big qu story for me in terms of progressive movement mm -hmm. and, and impact on Rhode Island uh, was, was right here with the lieutenant governor's race. Uh, Aaron Regenberg tried hard to, to really show, as did Matt Brown, uh, with the governor's uh, primary challenge, uh, that the progressive movement was kind of on the upswing. I, I think the fact that both of them fell short really shows how, how moderate to conservative the Rhode Island Democratic Party is. Well, even though this is a blue state, um, this, is, this is not a, a particularly hospitable environment for progressive candidates, um, I, I would argue. Yeah, well, Matt Brown didn't bring it. So, you know, Matt Brown looked the part, played the part, and delivered nothing. He raised no money. He came in late. Uh, he actually splintered the progressive effort because they resented the fact that he didn't do what he needed to do to win. Aaron Regenberg overspent, threw in uh, you know six-figure money in the last few days trying to tip the scales uh, uh, on a commercial level. Uh, and ironically, if you think about it, the governor's race, you got a candidate from the progressive left who spent nothing. And you got a lieutenant governor candidate for a seat that most people ridicule in the yeah, state, truly. who spent a half a million dollars, and so uh, that that was an incongruency in in the race in the in the primary season that was was notable. But I would say that there is a difference uh, this year in in that it's a continuation of what you're speaking about, and the, you know, the progressive movement is a is a fascinating um, dynamic for the Rhode Island ruling class to deal with. Mm -hmm. They're very, very uncomfortable with it. They're, they're, uh, they're paralyzed by it. Uh, they're uncertain what the strategy is. If they were smart, they would be marrying the Republicans rather than continuing to keep that battle on this front. Uh, so you've got everything that happens in Rhode Island happens as a result of what happened to the General Assembly and the legislature. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see how many more seats are picked up. Uh, I'm guessing it'll be a lesser progress yeah. than it was in the last one. But I, as to your point, I don't think they're going to lose any ground. Regenberg's mission, interesting cat, this guy, he, 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 he thought that he would kind of lead that charge from Lieutenant Governor's office and massage that position into his own version of what most lieutenant governors have been, which has been entrepreneurial in that job. It has very little constitutional demand on it. Uh, Stay alive. Well, it, it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's there in case the governor buys the farm, right? And it's, and it's there to you know, sit on a couple of boards and, and, and behave perfunctorily. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's there 
in it in the nature of it or it's morphed to a place where you can do your own thing. Um, like Liz, Liz Roberts. Liz example. Roberts, you know, yeah. is on is kind of in your wheelhouse with the healthcare yeah. issues, right? That was kind of her thing. Uh, Danny McKee is a former. He's my mayor, Cumberland mayor. Uh, very, very about the mezzanine level of government, which I think has become wholly more effective in this state. Meaning mayors, people who lead communities, they have a much more significant hands-on role in what happens at the legislature. They've got a platform from which they can speak and and, and really have impact. Uh, issues, he has been. I think he's been terrific in in, in 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 coordinating that particular level of government, and uh, he's done some things on a small business level and been at the PUC and saved some taxpayers some money. And people joke about the position, and the guy has probably saved more money net uh, for the taxpayers as a Democrat in that seat than anybody in the governor's seat has done in a while. Even though it's negligible, nobody saves anybody any money in the state for that. Uh, so, so that's that was kind of the funny place there. But that's the movement, the progressive movement, uh, nationally and here, uh, forced to be reckoned with, uh, passionate, and you're always more passionate when you're on the come versus trying to hold on to the to the place that you have. Right? The nature of the game is that is that you know the underdog fights harder. So it's been it's been a it's been a dilemma. And then Matty Yellow is. He's got that problem right now. He's got he's got a, a progressive front that he deals with in the legislature, and he's got a he's got a conservative Republican that's banging at him from the other side, and he's got problems, headaches. So I think I think you know, I agree that the progressive movement is is something for us to pay attention to. I just don't think that right now it you know there's much energy there. I do think 2020 2022. That's going to be a situation that Rhode Island is going to have to deal with in, in a way that it hasn't dealt with yet. And I think everyone needs to be on notice. Langevin needs to be on notice. Uh, Reed needs to be on notice because if, if, if Rhode Island goes the way, which I, I agree, that uh, there's a progressive movement nationally and there, it's starting to emerge here, bubble up here, these candidates, like the candidates in Massachusetts, like the candidates in New York, they have to, they, they, they should be on notice. And so I do think. Two years, four years down the road, uh, it's going to be a different story. Yeah, but you got to you got to distinguish between what 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 end game you're talking about. There's a there's a national federal conversation that obviously impacts the races you're speaking mm -hmm. about when it comes to Congress. You know, two seats in Congress and our two seats in, in the Senate, obviously. Um, Hopefully, we keep the two seats in Congress. Too. That's well, yeah, that's that's that's, yeah. that's, that's important too, right? We that's don't know if that's going that, to happen. It, it's a jump ball. Yeah, yeah. it's a pretty close call, you know call because we're losing population. population. Right. Yeah. But. Uh, it, it, it's not a, it, it, it's much more than a slow burn right now in the General Assembly, much more. Uh, and you know, I joke, hold on to your wallets because it's it's going to get it's going to get rough around here uh, on well, state issues. Why don't you jump in? But I also want to say, when we're saying progressive, if you could speak to some of those issues and what some of the issues are that are mm -hmm. big right now. And I do have to say, as the only woman on the panel and the president of Rhode Island now. We do see a lot more women running for office. Which like, well, so I just have yeah. to say, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, but one of the things I think that that speaks to the challenge of changing things up here, it, right now this year, uh, one third of the seats in the General Assembly are uncontested. I mean, it's really hard to shake things up and bring about change when when you have incumbents who are basically a, a lock because they have they face no opposition. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's a big challenge. And for those of you who are not as familiar with Rhode Island, I mean, this this legislature is overwhelmingly democratic. It's a one-party state. I mean, most of the decisions happen there. There are essentially family disputes within the Democratic Party. I mean, you're looking at a Senate that's 33 to four. Uh, there are four Republicans, and, and they're they're inconsequential. I mean, yeah, I agree with Dan that, yeah, I think in some cases they, there's more common ground between some of the Republicans and some of the more moderate Democrats. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, the party is really not, not, not the, the Republican Party is not a factor. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it's 57 to 11 in the, um, in the, uh, the House. The so. Republican Party is a factor going forward in the sense that the Republican Party's values and issues match up with the conservative Democrats. The problem is nobody wants to admit that the brand differentiation is negligible compared to the point, the, the, the way they see the issues. Yeah. And so the dynamic there is, is such that there was one year in Don Cacheri's second year, now Don Cacheri is the former governor, a few students are in and out, uh, served eight years. 
In his second year, the Republicans played a pivotal role in all of the legislative initiatives mm -hmm. that he wanted to embrace because they had enough. Right. They had enough uh, to create um, uh, some veto threat, uh, and that was the last time that they were able to take a stand that that had a measurable uh, uh, outcome. But, but the, the the interesting dilemma that that exists right now and the stealth politics in the hallways that happens at the General Assembly is that when, at least in the last two years, when the, when the Speaker wanted to move something, he didn't speak, he wasn't as, as, as worried about moving his entire Democratic caucus as he was making sure the Republicans were on the right flank. Because that, you know, there's very little difference between a Rhode Island conservative Democrat and a Rhode Island Republican. That's true. There's very, very little difference. Um, Could you say what some of those issues are? It's, it's about money. It's about money. It's about spending, um, for the most part. Although we've gotten into a lot of the social issues, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, your organization has been uh, one of many that have kind of dictated this pace on, on 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 gender matters that have the old guard perplexed and and trying to, you know, uh, <coughs> appear as if they care and they don't. So it's uh, it's it's are we on the it, it's interesting. I think we are, right? Yeah. <laughs> you told me you guys are recording this. It's nothing. I've, I, it's nothing yeah. I haven't said. It's um, and for I mean, listen, the, the Me Too movement and 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 all of all all the things that, that surround that have have caused a a bubble up on on the female elected side. And the, the speaker has gone through the motions in, in terms of some sexual harassment training and, and the things that are going on there, but there's no real systemic change. So most of the stuff that they're concerned with is still dollars and cents, and they kind of deal with the social issues and the national conversation as a, a sidebar, right? And the Republicans aren't that interested in that stuff either, so they coalesce on the financial stuff. Um, you know, a car tax reduction, for right. instance, you know, which, which, by the way, is a phony issue. It's a complete phony issue. Uh, the car tax uh, reduction was the product of a last minute, holy crap, I'm in trouble in my statewide race in District 15. We better pull a rabbit out of the hat. That's the Speaker's District. That's the Speaker's District. Pulled out the car tax reduction, ill thought out, not planned completely not able to be put into play for months and months and months because it was nothing more than a campaign what if based on a political couple of beer strategy brainstorm session that came out of nowhere and now you've got the governor and the speaker arguing about who's the author of it mm -hmm. it's amazing it's amazing how how the politics and the pressure of politics can cause um, can cause change that has got a whole lot less to do with evaluation of quality of life and a whole lot more about whether I survived November 6th. It's amazing, it really is. No, all I'm going to say is that in addition to, which is related to, to funding money, but the question of immigration too. And you know, the mayor just, you know, uh, uh, by discussing his, his views on uh, ICE, Kind of, you put this front and center as well. He said that, that on my show. He said that on your show. Yeah. Yes, yes. So one he, of the dumbest things Mayor, <laughs> Mayor Lorza. Mayor Lorza. Yeah, yes. So, so issues of immigration have always been an issue here in the state of Rhode Island, and and, and conservative uh, Democrats have sided with Republicans on mm -hmm. this as well. So this is one of the issues that I mean, I guess you can make the the argument that it's 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 funding related, but it's also culturally related. It's you know, race related, and so that's also an issue that I think. Uh, uh, Kind of divides the yeah, but Domingo, I will tell you, all due respect, it sits it sits in the bottom tier of what issues drive you most importantly. If you poll the electorate, immigration continues to sit. If you take the top ten issues, it sits at seventh. Yeah. When so, you ask people about immigration issues, their emotional triggers kick in, and the debate is the bit the debate rages. Yeah, and that's um, the reason why they do it, right? Is to animate folks, right? But sure. I, I agree with you. But it's you know, not on the you, even, folks, even yeah, for absolutely. Latinos, yeah. you know, it's 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 important to them, but it's still the they're just like everybody yeah. else. Jobs, it's about education, jobs, and jobs, jobs and education, economic yeah. development. Yeah. Yeah. But speaking about the mayor, real quick, I, I will tell you, I had all the yes about today's show prior to us sitting down. I was trying to explain, I spent an hour and a half on the radio today, explaining the nonsense of, of branding 
versus versus doing the diligence on an issue. And I'll explain it because it's about this. So last night, the the mayor of Providence uh, says to me that he triples down on the sanctuary city conversation, and he says, paraphrasing, I am proud that Providence is a sanctuary city. I will keep Providence a sanctuary city because we had talked about ICE and some of the uh, the, the challenges that he's had with ICE, and he doubles down on it. And he talks about how, you know, immigration and the neighborhoods, and, you know, this is the, 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 the neighborhoods with a high dose of immigration are the safest neighborhoods in the city, and uh, I'm, a, I'm proud to manage and will keep Providence a sanctuary city. Okay. Split, split screen. The night before, the mayor of Cranston is having a battle with Joe Trillo, the, the, the more conservative Republican, and Gina Raimondo, the governor, to a certain extent, about, about his positions on, on sanctuary cities and community policing, and they're arguing about, about you know, who's more conservative. And he's trying to explain to the world that when he becomes governor, Rhode Island will not be a sanctuary city. Just look at the evidence in my own Cranston Police Department and how I've answered the call to the Trump administration, and I was the only mayor to answer the forum that they wanted to answer to confirm how our police department is going to react <coughs> to these situations. All right, here's the truth. The truth is, and all you have to do is ask the chief of police in each city, what difference is there between the city of Cranston and the city of Providence and how they deal, deal with immigration issues and, the, and ICE. And the answer is 0.0. .0. They both operate in exactly the same fashion. They both report to ICE if they've got somebody who's committed a felony. They both process somebody with a fingerprint, and if it comes up, oh, warrant and, and, and a claim by ICE, notify. But neither of them take somebody who looks like they might be, you know, illegal and give a phone ring to ICE. They both operate with the exact protocols and the exact system. Yet the mayor of Providence is pointing to his police department as evidence that he's a champion and a sanctuary city guy. And the guy who runs Cranston is using his police department as an example of how he's not a sanctuary city guy. So I was trying to explain to the listeners today that you've got to pay attention to the details and not the brand and the claim because they're both taking the same exact behavior and calling it something completely differently. So I think we could it's say crazy. Fung has a sanctuary city in Cranston. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I know that's not that's not how you're interpreting it, but well, the but, thing is, is that it's also an undefined term. Yeah. You cannot define it. If, uh, if we had a show yeah. of hands. It's, I could, I could say, sanctuary city is this, and you say, yeah, I agree with that. None of you could come up with the same general, there's no statutory definition of sanctuary city. And Jeff Sessions yeah. will tell you, yeah. none of you have a legal right. basis it's for right. it. So, right. so, I mean, it's, so you got to pay So, so I, I, you know, I think about sanctuary cities, I think that the main argument that mayors have made is that uh, they're not going to be, as you just suggested, you know, being proactive, helping ICE doing raids in, you know, factories, going to people's homes at 5 o'clock in the morning where their families are sleeping. That's what they mean, I think, by sanctuary city. Um, and so to that, to, if that's the definition, according to mayors, then I would say that sounds like Cranston is not um, being as cooperative with, with, with ICE as, as Fung would suggest. <clears throat> well, let's Correct. do one more question before we open it up. I'll sure. give it to Professor Hackey first so you get the... So what do you think is the most pres pressing electoral issue, both in Rhode Island and then also in Providence, since we're all... Well, many of us here are Providence residents. I think it comes back to the economy. I mean, to, to, to Dan's point, I think, I think you know, uh, the most pressing issue for us is you know, how well the Rhode Island economy is doing. The, the, the race is really hinging upon that, and a lot of them, the messaging we're seeing on the campaign trail. Uh, Governor Raimondo is pointing to, you know, the glass is half full, whether it's a glass of milk or a glass of beer on her commercials. Uh, we're, see we're, see we're seeing the progress made there. Um, and uh, as she, you know, the line from 2014 was, you know, we, we had no cranes in the sky. Well, we've got a lot of cranes in the sky now. Um, something that Dan brought up earlier, uh, the Paw Sox. I think, um, th as a native Rhode Islander, uh, that was that was a tough one to lose the Paw Sox. Um, polling data seemed to suggest that most most residents were not terribly invested in keeping that belief. They they'd like them to stay, but they didn't want to pay, uh, which I think. Uh, they they said so this is the dig deep on the polling data. That's the general take. But if you look closely at the polling data, here's what it said. 
Do you want to keep the paw socks? 75%, yes. For sure. Do you want to pay for the paw socks? To your point, Bob. No. Do you know that we're already in a public-private partnership with the paw socks right now, which is the same formula that we're proposing? Huh. 58% approved. This was that 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 was the worst example of transparency, truthfulness, diligence, cooperation in government that I've seen since I've been here. People were not as animatedly opposed to that project as those squeaky wheels who made it out to seem that way portrayed them to be. And it required, sometimes leadership requires spending a little less time worrying about fake polls, not fake news, but fake polls, uh, or unreported polls, or half-reported polls, and requires a little bit of vision about you know, where we're going and, and what's the right thing to do. I asked Gina Raimondo at the Irish wake that the city of Pawtucket had the, week, the day or two after the Paw Sox deal went to Worcester. I asked her a question that I knew the answer to, which was, how much time did you, as the governor, spend in a room, or how many times did you get into a single room with the key players, meaning the Senate president, the Speaker of the House, and the ownership of the Paw Sox? How much time, and the city of Pawtucket, those were the five parties. And she's like, oh, often. Oh, my gosh. I, I can't count the hours. Well, the answer was never. Mm. Not once. What was tough for her was I got that answer on the air and on the record on my microphone two minutes prior with the mayor of Pawtucket when I asked him the same question, which I knew the answer to because I was intimately involved in following that both on and off the record all the way through. She never brought all the parties together to get in a room grab a pizza and a few beers and say, we're not leaving here until we figure this thing out and present it, you know, this way. And why? Because the Speaker of the House, you know, wanted to deal with the Paw Sox when it came to pro when the Providence deal. He wanted the first deal. And he felt like he got hung out and the governor didn't support him. So he was pissed. So he didn't want to give her any credit, but he said to her, if you can bring this across, I'll bring it across the line as long as the Senate President is with you on the stuff that I need to do on something else. So she's out there going through the motions with her economic development people trying to play the Paw Sox. The Paw Sox are trying to make a deal with the Speaker of the House because, as we've said, he's the most powerful guy in the state. The Senate President's a union guy, so he's all for this deal, so he's making a deal uh, to rearrange that which the Speaker wanted and then went on a public nine-month beautifully executed program for public hearings to get a deal that the Senate could pass, all the while knowing that the Speaker would never pass it. The governor, rather than calling them all out on it, just kind of said, well, listen, it's all their fault if they don't do it, and offered a tepid, you know, support of the whole thing. Meanwhile, the Paw Sox are negotiating with Worcester and then throwing money on the table left and right. And that's how the deal blew up, because none of them would get together, and all each of them wanted to do was point at the other for being the culprit not getting it done. It was yeah. a disgrace. Do you think this is a big issue in the election? I mean, because I, I, I don't see the, a lot of finger pointing right happening right now. No. Who lost the process? No, because the media hasn't made it, uh, you know, other than, and even I, if, I'm so exhausted. Uh, I'm so exhausted by it and disgraced by their leadership that I think most people are just kind of like, yeah, whatever. There's a, uh, there's a built in level of uh, depression in in the quality of life in the state of Rhode Island where expectations are so low for leadership and government performance that when things disappoint the electorate here, they kind of just shrug it off and go to the beach because it's beautiful. Well, I think that's a really important point because it, op it provides a window to understanding how leadership functions in, in our state, right? And that an, an issue like this, that all of the stakeholders seem to be at some level interested in making it happen, weren't able to make it happen for all of these reasons that you just mentioned. So think about all these other issues, education. So you, your, your question about, uh, you know, what's the most pressing if, issue, whether it's, you know, jobs, education, just think about the failure uh, w without really knowing, but understanding how they work together or don't work <coughs> together, how, what types of issues, what types of problems that presents for the, the big issues that we do have in the state, right? Mm -hmm. So. 
Uh, it's, it's a sad state. <clears throat> uh, just a quick point on education. I think one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm expecting to pass, but it's an important issue. Uh, the governor put this on the agenda this mm -hmm. year with her State of the State speech. Uh, we have a $250 million ballot initiative uh, to, to fund improvements to Rhode Island schools this year. Um, Rhode Island tends to pass initiatives uh, without a whole lot of controversy. I expect this one to, to sail through. Um, but this is the most significant investment in education we've made in a generation or more. So, and uh, it's not nearly enough. And it's not, it's and a drop in the bucket. Yeah. 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 And it's also yeah. the product of another line of baloney because she talked about it in her state of the state as it being part of a half a billion dollar initiative. The truth of the matter is that a quarter million dollars, a quarter billion dollars is already built into the budget because we still, as decrepit as our public schools are, there's still that much money going into co-sharing the, 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 the fixing of them. This right. quarter billion is brand new. And by the way, it is all spoken for. Mm -hmm. There's a long list of school systems that are already in that, in that hopper. Oh, and as you. soon as it gets passed, it's spent and gone. And we won't have another one for another two years. So you tell me if you think that's the, the, the right amount of, uh, of capital investment in this state. It's not. But there's a thirst, right? Rhode, Rhode Island residents want to invest, right? They, they, they want to improve the schools. And so it's if we were- Literally raining the schools. <laughs> literally, so. yeah. So, and, and, and so I think that's a sign of where Rhode Islanders are, uh, not only with education, but I think with other issues, that they're willing to, to invest as long as it's going to lead to, you know, better schools, better economy, but it remains to be seen how actually how. But there's not that. enough bold leadership. I mean, I think, and I think one of the things that's interesting when you look at when you look at Massachusetts or Rhode Island, you've got two former CEO governors here. You know, um, Gina doesn't stack up well. Charlie's the most uh, popular governor in the United States, and Gina's you know trying to hang on in a three-way race here. Um, the Massachusetts economy has been hot. Uh, we have been playing catch up. We are always we are always kind of first into the recession and last out, and and that is I think that's that that pattern um, leads us to a lot of self doubt. We need someone to kind of to, to this point about leadership. We need someone to take the reins and, and have a vision. I, 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 the vision that Dan described for the Paw Sox, it just needs to be writ large for the state's economic development mission. We we tend to do a lot of things kind of incrementally. We do a company at a time, try to woo this one, do that. But we we don't have a terribly competitive business. Well, the life. vision thing, the vision thing is about about the elected officials' objective in, 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 in their career perspective. This state will 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 improve by leaps and bounds when we elect a governor who just wants to make this state great, as opposed to it being a stepladder for something else. Don Kacheri had a chance to do that. He hit a terrible recession, and the timing wasn't right, right? He had no plans to do anything else. I promise you, Gina Raimondo wins this race, and she will. If this thing flips in 2020, she's gone. She's gone. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but one of the things that this, this state needs that extra oomph of vision, which is that if you want to lead this place, you also need to be accountable for long term and your legacy needs to be about what you've done for it. And that's the difference between, and it's who you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with professional political types, some in state but a lot of out, out of state, who really are about the landscape and latching on to stars in the political world. No, the politics is not like any other business. And there's nothing wrong with the word politics, by the way. It's not a dirty word, but it's a career word. When people talk about career politicians, I never have a qualm with that as long as the career has a worthy objective. But if you, the, this state is so unique in its needs that it needs somebody who, who, who eats, breathes, sleeps, drinks the success and the quality of life of this place and who loses sleep about it every single night. We haven't had that kind of leadership. We don't have that kind of leadership in the General Assembly. That place is about self-sufficiency and about, it's just a, it's a disease. The place, you walk in with a mission, you walk out just worrying about yourself. And when it comes to gubernatorial leadership, uh, even senatorial leadership to a certain extent. Jack Reed is a national player. Getting Jack Reed on a local show is like, is, is, like, is, is like finding a needle in the haystack, but you'll find him on Fox News on Sunday morning like that. Sheldon plays the same kind of game. David and Jim, to a certain extent, you know, a little bit more pedestrian because Congress kind of works that way. But when it comes to the governor's race, that's what you need. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not bullish on this next four years um, because of that. That's not the commitment, you know. You know, she didn't commit to that Paw Sox save because she did a measurement. 
It was about counting chips when we want to put in. It's not about it's not about how incredible it would have been for the quality of life of the state of Rhode Island. You come down Massachusetts in 1995, all of a sudden you get these big bright lights 70 nights a week, going, wow, this is a dynamic place. She didn't see that as important, because you know, in two years you're not going to be living here anyway. It's just, uh, it's... <laughs> We might have some different okay. opinions in the room, so why don't we open it up to questions? I don't see how thoughts. anybody could disagree with anything I have said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure some of your listeners, including you. Oh, well, the tables have turned, Dan. So, okay. Who would like? Yeah. We have a mic for you here. I'm surprised. There's, I'm surprised there's not more airtime on the unfunded public pension funds mm, mm. and the drag that it has on the city schools, mm. on the state. And I don't see anyone really addressing that, and, and it concerns me. I, I'm a newbie. I've, I've yeah. moved here two years ago, so I come Where from, from a different, from Western Connecticut. Okay. Western or Western? Western. Western. So pensions. Uh, I, don't, I don't see Professor Marianor here, but uh, Professor Marianor and I and and others are doing some work on this on on pensions and. So here's the the thing: it's not just Rhode Island; it's everywhere, right? <laughs> people, people are not people are not dealing with this. It's a it's a national problem. So the, the dilemma is right. So you have uh, this unfunded pension liability skyrocketing, and what do you do as a mayor or you know as a governor? In this case, I you know I think um, th th let's let's focus on cities for a while. Um, w what do you do, right? You promise this to workers. And are you going to be the one that says, we're not going to give you what we promised you? Or take it away from, from workers and have the unions come, come at you, right? And ultimately, you promise. The families and, and, and the, their children to get a, a good education, and so maybe you honor one promise, but you aggravate another. Well, I'll tell you, your 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 issue is really important. I used to spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's a ticking time bomb, and the human nature being what it is, it will only be when the crisis erupts that the response will be there. The state pension issue has been somewhat resolved with yep. the reform that Gina Raimondo brought as treasurer. The real ticking time bomb is the municipal pension mm -hmm. problems that exist. In fact, Jorge Loiza, the mayor, is trying to sell the water supply board in order to be able to grab $300 million to try to cure a billion dollar unfunded yeah. pension liability. One of the dumbest ideas ever. Uh, you know what, uh, it, it, it very well may be. Uh, I can't tell you, I've spent a lot of time doing the math on what the alternative is. But it's not just the pensions. It's the unfunded health benefits, mm -hmm. known as OPEB, other, other pension and employment benefits, which, which are running in the couple of billion dollar deficit place right now. So you're, you're wise to point it out. Uh, it's not a marketable issue to the constituents until such time as the thing busts. And it'll bust in a way that will 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 be really 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 uh, obvious to everybody because we'll have we'll have um, bankruptcy reorgs all across. So that to Professor Domingo's you know query, the answer won't be in that in that in that um, in that juxtaposition between promises made and promises kept. It will be without control. Everyone's going to go under. Do you want to speak to Central Falls at all? Yeah, and so the so role of that, that yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, cent too. so Falls people in Providence did. are looking at Central Falls and saying, you know, you got people who can't afford to pay rent or eat because they went, they did this deal, they cut their pensions to supposedly save the city of Central Falls, and now they can't pay their bills, right? And so the people in Providence, you know, that's not bringing the people in Providence to to the negotiating table because we worked. And this was promised to us, and what you want us to do the same thing that folks in Central Falls did? There's not an easy solution yeah, to this. City, I don't know. City, city to city, union leadership is as culpable for this as political leadership is, is because they they do the same math, mm -hmm. and they've been driving this thing, hedging their bets and hoping for a long, long period of time. Um, 
it's it, it is it's not going to be managed by some great think. It's going to be managed by the whole place busting up. A crisis, having, crisis and, management. And having yeah. Central Falls be be one of the, the many examples um, on, on how to handle that. And who did the bankruptcy in Central Falls? Uh, Bob the Flanders. Flanders. Bob yeah. Flanders. Well, he, he Special ma master. He yes. managed yeah. the he managed the bankruptcy and did a very effective job yeah. at it. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you. Yeah. So. yeah. We can go this way. The, the UHIP scandal, I, sorry, I don't think anybody mentioned it. I came in a little late. Um, the UHIP scandal was very personally devastating for my family and some of my friends' families. And it's had a big impact on the way I've thought about politics. Um, like having been liberally educated, I've been thinking more lately about would I vote for someone based on their policies or based on their execution, especially now that I've been very personally influenced by a really irresponsible decision that was made. Um, and so my question is mostly for, is it Dan? Yeah. Dan, but also everybody else. Um, what role do you think the UHIP scandal is gonna play in this election? And do you think that there might be other people like me who um, normally would vote liberal, but for whom this is, like, because this was an issue that affected so many people so right. personally? Right, so your, your political ideology is, is, is dwarfed by um, competency issues and and will it play a role in the election yeah it takes Gina Raimondo down from a possible 52 to 46 and she wins mm -hmm. so I mean that that's that's part of the drag that she has on her in this election that that this has been poorly managed and uh, uh, poorly explained so there's a difference between between mistakes honestly uh, discussed transparency, mea culpas, and, and doing the right things. It took a long time to admit that they were behind the eight ball. Remember, she inherited this Deloitte system uh, that runs the UHIP project. Um, but it's all, it's, you know, when it's on your plate, it's your job to execute. Didn't she authorize the bill, like even though it was there previously? Uh, it's Chafee authorized it prior, prior to that. Right. This is, this is, Chafee's, this is Chafee's project. Deloitte comes in transitionally between between the two administrations. And we're um, not paying, the state yeah. is no longer paying them. Oh, They're, we're paying. Well, 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 well we're, we've stopped payment. We've stopped but, payments, but yeah. We've stopped payment right now. Uh, it will slowly, uh, I'm sure you don't want to discuss your own personal situation, but it will slowly uh, continue to improve, not at the pace I'm sure that you and some others want, but they've done a better job uh, with it. But will it impact the race? Yeah, it's why she sits in, in the mid 40s type of because of you know competency issues like that. If I could speak to that, I think that one of the interesting things for me is how how relatively under the radar it has been in this election. I th I thought I thought that Fung and others would really be be using beating the drum more loudly, and that would be a, a more important issue for us. I mean, it's a half a billion dollar project. Uh, the results have been really really poorly executed. For those of you who don't know, this is the Unified Health Infrastructure Project. It's designed to pull all of the different themes uh, programs together that folks apply for: food stamps, uh, cash assistance, Medicaid, uh, child support, all these things together under one roof uh, and have a unified application. Um, part of what the governor doesn't say is that, you know, yes, Deloitte had problems, but it was essentially moving the goalposts because the state kept issuing change orders for, for what they wanted. And, and so every time they, they, they would change the requirements for what they were looking for with the system, Deloitte had to then go back through and devise new workouts. Yeah, all true. All true. And in case that, that clear explanation wasn't good enough, it's the brain that runs for the stuff that people need. It's the it's the it's the food stamps. Yep. It, it's the healthcare exchange now. It's all those things, but it really is. It's like it's just a major screw up because at the at the beginning and the end, you can you can talk about all the the contractual stuff and the consultancy mess and the you know I am the worst IT guy on the planet. I don't understand this stuff for nothing. But all I know is this: if I was the boss, I'd be going, okay. Does this new thing work? Yeah, boss. It, what about the old thing? Are we throwing the old thing out? Because if we're throwing the old thing out, this new thing has got to work. Yeah, boss, it's going to work. Why don't we do this? Is there a way to keep the old thing working while we do the new thing? thing? Because if we do the new thing and we throw out the old thing and the new thing doesn't work, we're screwed, right? Don't worry, boss. The new thing will work. Guess what they did? They flipped the switch, threw out the old thing, put in the new thing, and the new thing didn't work. Okay, 
IT people can explain it in a much more sophisticated way than I do. But if I'm the boss, I go, don't you dare hang me out. That old thing better work if we need it. Well, let's not fire all those people who run the old thing before we bring the new thing And they in. did. They literally they laid off, off dozens of people because they assumed right. that the new system would be so efficient they That's would not be needed. That's a competency issue. That's a problem. Well, and, and, and to compound that, as you said, it wasn't, it wasn't explained to the electorate or you know, to, to the citizens of Rhode Island what was happening, walking them through the situation so that people understand. Uh, sure. it, you know, and her <laughs> pedestrian <laughs> management style doesn't exist. And so what I'm talking about, and again, you know, Jean and I go, go back, and I, you know, she's, I've, seen, I've seen her transition from an earnest treasurer candidate and treasurer to a, a corporate uh, elected type. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she's still great in her personal life and wonderful mother to her kids and all those things. And I say that because I like her. I mean, I do. I like her. But I've seen her change in the way she goes about it. Mm -hmm. There is no way in God's green earth, if I was the governor of this state, and someday you never know, I would have Heard never left. Wow, was I, that an announcement? I, well, I'm, I'm just saying. Wow. Make a news, make a news. <laughs> you I'm, heard it here well, first. Well, I'm telling you that okay. there, there are, you know, I, my wife kills me when I talk about it, but there are fantasies that I have about it because I love this place. I've learned to love it. And what I, what I know is this. We're big enough to be sophisticated in that role, but we're small enough to roll your sleeves up and give a damn about what's going on in the streets and in the hallways. And so when people like you were struggling with whatever benefit and or process that you needed fixed, I would have been sleeves up, jacket off, in the hallways, talking to people about what it is that they were suffering with, and she did none of that. Mm -hmm. That's true. And so she didn't really understand from the underbelly of the, of the problem the, the, the bottom-up, panic and concern that people were having and she wasn't listening to the career employees who were going whoa they and said course, it wasn't now ready. of course between her and them are a series of, 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 of people who also fell down on that job yeah. but who didn't have that charge which is let me tell you guys we 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 screw this up you're all dead dead we're dead we all we now Rhode Island holding her accountable for that Two dynamics. This campaign is absent this conversation. Yeah. And this goes. It was the first question in the gubernatorial debate. Well, that, that, that's it's a, not an. It's the, the, not the, a, the debates are, are uh, you know, a. a, a, a we have ads a, about. They're a component. Right. Instead. But, right. you know, just because Alan Fung and Joe Trillo are caught screaming at each other all the time, they spend very little time. You know, do you know Gina? I don't know. The first debate, I don't know if you saw the Channel 12 debate. Uh, Gina Raimondo stood between Alan Fung and Joe Trillo and had this, are we, where's this going to be broadcast? On, 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 uh, this shit-eaten grin on her face, which was just priceless. You'll have to edit that, guys. Uh, just priceless. As she watched them argue with each other about things that she had no worry about. And that's why this race is going to be the way it is and why that issue is not driving the race because these guys haven't brought it. Let's just, we had a few more hands up and we don't have much more time. So I just want to make sure people get a chance to ask their questions. Okay. Um, so I come from a state, uh, I come from a state in which both political parties are definitely a factor in state politics and in which the legislature is often divided. Um, and so what then, state? From Washington state. So mm. definitely decidedly more democratic, but until 2017, the state Senate was controlled by Republicans. Mm. Um, and so then to come to a state like Rhode Island in which, um, like you said before, it's really more of a, of a one-party kind of system, I'm just wondering um, how that dynamic affects the public policy process and how having such one-party dominance um, might make that either better or worse in your estimation. I don't think we have the clash of ideas you'd like to see, in a, in a, a, a healthy clash of ideas. Um, where you know, I think that, you know, to Dan's point, I think earlier, um, you know, when the Republicans have had more folks in positions, uh, they've been able to exact some concessions. They've been able to be a player, that, and, and you get different points of view. Uh, when, when you're when you're outnumbered thirty-three to four uh, in you know in the Senate, I mean, it's really you, 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 to say you're inconsequential. I, 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 and I don't mean that they can't be consequential, but at the moment, there's and that the, the party infighting right now within the Republican Party in the state is remarkable. I mean, the fact that Patricia Morgan didn't in, endorse. Uh, Alan Fung uh, after a hard fought primary, but it was still, I mean, it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, there's a bloodletting that's going on here. Uh, and I, I don't see a whole lot of folks emerging within the ranks 
of the Republican Party, either at the legislative level or at the local level, uh, who are going to really take take up the, the charge to, to kind of move on and have some more competitive races here. I mean, it's got, and that's got to start locally you know, and filter up. You got to typically have folks who are running for state office and you know, at the state legislature, and then ultimately they'll run seek state state level offices and ultimately then move on to senator or yeah. representative. But see, what happens is that you have people that in other states would be Republicans, they run as Democrats, and they're considered either moderate or conservative Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a problem because oftentimes what we use as, as, as voters, we use parties as a cue for how we think people are going to behave politically. So Democrats are going to do X, Republicans are going to do X, and in a state like ours, it throws it off because we don't really know. So you but the have D gets a, you a win. A exactly. D gets you a win, but if you're a if you're a D, you're fighting for progressive liberal policies. It's not necessarily going to get you a win. So it, it's problematic in that sense. Whereas in Washington, you know that the Democrats are fighting for higher minimum wage, these kinds of things, and it's not necessarily the case with all the Democrats here in Rhode Island. Right? Well, and the speaker, for example, has a hundred percent rating from the NRA and yeah. is endorsed by Rhode Island Right to Life. So I mean, th th those are not to your point. Those are not typical yeah. Democratic. We uh, have the same. The primary matters. We, we have, we have the yeah. same fissures that you find in your home state. They're just not branded with Republican and Democrat right. on that on that delineatable li line, um, which is why I'm always telling my listeners and, and viewers to, to to spend less time worrying about party affiliation and more time listening to what they're saying about things. Um, yet people do, uh, to the points well made here. People do tend. St we, you know, we're a unique place in this state. We, we know what the rules are nationally, uh, and, and we think nationally. We watch the same MSNBC and CNN and Fox and, and all of that, but we don't apply the uniqueness of the state and separate that the game is not necessarily played the same way here. Um, the same arguments occur, you know, on policy issues. Uh, which is why I was talking about that progressive movement on the Democratic side. You know, you've got a half of the Democratic Party in the state that really leans more Republican to the point here, but don't want the brand because the brand is unfixable. Electable. Yeah, it's, it's just unfixable. It's a very weird, weird, yeah. weird place. Maybe one more question. Yeah. I just want to push back a little bit on the idea that Joe Trillo's numbers, whether it's five percent or seventeen percent or something else altogether. We met the other night. Didn't we, we met the other. I called yes. you. Yes, yeah, good, good to see you, yeah. um, uh, Professor Hackey. More than more, than, you had mentioned that Alan Fung is is you know he's probably the person who dreads the Trillo campaign more than anyone. I think that's pretty accurate. But Should I, I do, absolutely. But I also think that within that, whether it's 17 percent or 5 percent and 11 percent undecided, uh, uh, undecided that the ABC6 poll showed, there's a large percentage of Rhode Island voters, obviously, who are independent, that's the largest voting bloc, but that are dissatisfied with both Governor Raimondo and Alan Fung. Mm -hmm. Whether they know who Trillo is or not, you know, they're, that, that they're voicing um, you know, an opinion that has nothing to do with taking votes away from Mayor Fung or necessarily Governor Raimondo. They may not vote at all, but they just have heard of Trillo. They've seen the bus, or they, they hear an alternative voice. How much do you think that in the future, a non-Trumpian independent voice can make a move in a future election, whether at the senatorial level, which is unlikely, obviously, but in 2022? We've tried in the past. I mean, I, I think of Ken Block. You know, who tried to establish a new political party in the state, the moderate party, um, and I think Ken Ken certainly tried to um, find find a middle ground there that would would appeal. I, th I think certainly the the fact that Trillo was uh, was chairing Trump's campaign here is is not something that's going to endear him to Democrats. Uh, but I, I think uh, he does tend to pull a lot of folks from the conservative side of the ledger who normally would f would support Fung. Um, I, I don't I don't. Uh, in terms of finding a more moderate perspective, I, again, I'm not. I'm looking at the landscape of, of Rhode Island politics. I'm not sure who that would be. I mean, it, someone like a Bob Flanders. I mean, but obviously he's otherwise occupied at the moment. I don't know if it's, if this is going to be a one and done for him. Um, you know, we've had we've had you know we've had some other folks who've who've run unsuccessfully. Uh, my answer is absolutely. Dan, you are 2022. You heard it here. No, no, no. I, no I, I, again, I, I, let's not, let's, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get over my skis here, but the answer is absolutely. Uh, the, it's, you, you get an independent energy with it, which is 
you know, a round peg square hole all the way through this election. He's the co-chair, he's the chair of the Trump campaign in a blue state that, that carves out, you know, all the progressives that wanted to vote for Matt Brown, where else were they going to go? I mean, that's why Gina Romano is going to win this yeah, race. Sure. They weren't going to go anywhere. Alan Fung is, you know, a B-plus player at best playing a C-minus campaign. Al, you know, Joe Trillo, to Bob's point, is going to take some numbers away from Alan Fung, but not just from Alan Fung. But he missed an opportunity. There was a window. There's a window for an independent to, 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 to hit a skid and go. And I think he missed it. He missed it with, with some of the behavior problems and getting mired down mm -hmm. in, in, you know, again, the vision thing. Most people want to know what you want to do rather than how much you hate the other guy. So he's kind of he's kind of more or less cooked his own goose. Um, but I do think that there's, remember, the, what, what is the largest body of registered voters in the state of Rhode Island? Unaffiliated. Unaffiliated. Yeah. Unaffiliated. Unaffiliated. Yeah. There's a, an absolute window there. And speaking of Flanders, just in case you guys are following this, the most ironic thing about this governor's race is the guy who could have beat Gina Raimondo is the guy who's running for Senate. If Bob Flanders decided that he wanted to run as a Republican for governor, I think he would, be, he would have been incredibly Absolutely. formidable yeah. because he's the former Supreme Court justice. He is the guy that managed Central Falls, whether you like the outcome or not. Yeah. He has an impeccable record, is a true Rhode Islander, and is smart as hell. But the job of, of governor is a managerial, I mean, you say what you want. And, 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 you know, I've picked on Gina, and today I was talking about how she was correct on this sanctuary city thing. She's correct on a lot of things. She's done some things very well. I don't agree with her economic policy, which is to pick winners versus creating fertile ground of taxation and the like, but she's made progress and she's done some good things. You sit in the governor's seat for four years around this place and you're gonna make a lot of enemies and you're gonna and there's a lot of things that you're gonna screw up because it's a managerial job, hands on. I don't think Flanders wanted to take that on. There's a kind of a coolness about being senator. You know, you listen Most a lot. Club you, in the world. you meet a lot. You listen a lot. Your staff writes for you a lot. You vote a lot. You travel a lot. It's very, it's very it's, state. -specific. Especially from Rhode Island, the senators from Rhode Island have the best job in yeah. politics. They're known what they're. They, 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 well, I mean, they, they could travel yeah. forty minutes, right, from one side of the state to the other. Sure. Think about a senator from California, right? right? You have to raise a lot of money. You have to yeah. spend a lot of time traveling in Rhode Island. You're, so it's, I, I would argue, is the best job in politics be. to be a U.S. It, senator it, it from the state be. of Rhode The thing about Bob yeah. Flanders is, is that he decided that he could convince people that he would be a, quote, better senator. Yeah. If, if, if people go like, what the hell does that mean? You should watch his commercials if you yeah, haven't. Yeah. You know, that, that and, and he's taken a couple of, to Hillary's point, he's taken a couple of, you know, funny, funny, not so bad, but cheap shots. You know, calling you know Sheldon a doofus in the gas bag. They're trying to take the funny. You know, and, and it's like being. You know, the term is gross, but you know, the term half pregnant. You're, 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 you're kind of. You're in it, but you're not. You're in it, but you're not. he wants to be competitive and, 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 and fiery, and, and and he wants to he wants to do the negative ad. But I don't really want to do it that much because I have to live in this community because my reputation is more important to me than than selling out completely and doing a you know a firestorm on Sheldon. So let's do something cute and call him a gas bag. You know, it's that whole kind of uh, 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 can't get it there. Doesn't want to fight hard enough to take that that thing out. But he, on a one-on-one, -on -one, the the field would have cleared for Flanders as a Republican, cleared, and it would have been a one-on-one -on -one battle, and he had a great chance of beating her. But what about the notion of a, of an independent? Because you know, our last independent governor, Link Chafee, did not exactly uh, hit it out of the park. Yeah, but in this yeah, cycle, yeah, there would have been yeah. no independent candidate. Well, Every, last everybody cycle, would have looked the at that. independent got over twenty percent. No. Well, that right. was Bob, that Bob Healy. Bob Healy was moderate. Yeah. 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 And Bob yeah. Healy, but you know, serious. but think yeah. about how many elections Bob Healy ran, right. trying to make fun of Lieutenant Governor's right. position right. and developed a reputation. And but he hit that skid that I was talking about. He was at eleven percent three weeks out and finished at twenty-two. Yeah. Um, that. You know. I just quickly, because we're, we're finishing up here, but I do think that there are at least two roads to consider for a viable independent candidate. One is the moderate one, right, that we've been discussing and we're more familiar with. But I do think that the battle that's happening within the Democratic Party, as progressives gain more strength, that's going to push um, a, a different type of independent, I think, um, uh, provide a, a window for another type of independent, a more progressive type of independent to also emerge as well. Because I don't think that. Th for progressives, the Democratic Party is going to be the home. Um, not right now, at least. So. Well, I would say if you come, is it next Thursday with Tom Perez and Michael Steele? 
Chairman Perez would have a very different take, which is we don't we're not progressives and we're not moderates or conservative Democrats. We're Democrats and we want to achieve and these yeah. labels are and not I, worthwhile. So it's probably worth coming next week yeah, well, to continue yeah. the conversation. So thank you all so much for coming. I hope you I'm sure you all learned a lot tonight and have some commercials and things to go watch. So thank you for coming on this blustery night and hope to see you another time. Thank you.